you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to try to respect the 20 minute rule as our other speakers have and keep this as informal and conversational if possible. My, in my first attempt to do this, I reduced the number of crises I was going to talk about to one crisis. And then this morning I decided even that was a little too much and I started taking out some of the more substantive, you know, evidentiary paragraphs. And I'm just going to be suggestive. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so here goes. My general point is that emotion is operative in all cultural change and works something like the wind in our sails. It does not determine the course of change, but it does set limits. This approach is built around a recognition uh, that thought and emotion are not separate things, but they are, the, they are the same thing, the same kind of thing, presenting itself to awareness, so to speak, either front on or from the side. <clears throat> Taken this way, it goes without saying that a transformation of emotional experience was a crucial feature of the coalescence of a secular outlook in late 17th century Europe a transformation visible in new forms of sociability as much as in the printed word. In 1500, an inexplicable change of heart, a strong feeling, a sudden sense of certainty was for many European Christians likely to be interpreted as a message from beyond. The problem was to determine who had sent it, the Holy Spirit or the devil. But in a fully disenchanted world, if there is such a thing, something like the one John Locke described in his essay concerning human understanding in 1690, the inside of the self is insulated from exterior influences except through the operation of the senses, leaving one, so to speak, alone with one's thoughts and emotions. I mean, there's a version of this in Hobbes as well, and there's another version somewhat different in Descartes and so on. By 1700, increasingly, European Christians were experiencing their emotions as, as movements which, uh, within a sealed off, whoops, sorry, as movements within, that is, movements within, sorry, <laughs> sealed off from the outside world, movements whose currents and ripples had to be examined with care. Isolated as these inner spaces were, one's interpretation of them was understood as also as entirely private, applicable to oneself alone. Intellectual trends were the, just the tip of the iceberg here, but they're a good place to start. So let me just read a few uh, exemplary uh, quotes. This is from 1691, Christian Tomasius writing in Hala. <coughs> He urged his readers not to be so trusting and to start doubting. Quote, doubt the prejudice of authority. In exploring truth, never rely on the authority of any person, whoever it may be, if you do not feel an inner certainty uh, that the persuasion you have believed so far is necessarily connected to already recognized fundamental truths. Uh, don't be put off by the cry of those who have an interest in not letting the world be wrenched out of its common errors. Your governors, your parents, your teachers. Ethics will demonstrate to you that we are admittedly obliged to adjust our outward acting and refraining according to the will of our superiors and elders, but the understanding is subject to no laws because it depends on our free will. Well, John Locke, uh, in his letter concerning toleration, wrote somewhat similarly, all the life and power of true religion consists in the inward and full persuasion of the mind, and faith is not faith without believing. <clears throat> Locke differed from Tamasius on the question of outward acting. He said, whatever profession we make, to whatever outward worship we conform, we are not fully satisfied in our mind that the one is true and the other well-pleasing unto God. Such profession and such practice 
far from being any furtherance, are indeed great obstacles to our salvation. So anything that's imposed on you is going to be an impediment to your achieving salvation. You only ought to be required to do what you are, what you are persuaded is right inwardly and fully. <clears throat> Um, Pierre Bale made a similar distinction when in 1686 uh, in his uh, argument for freedom of conscience that the individual conscious could err in good faith, could be mistaken in good faith. Uh, <clears throat> it was Bale's view with that with the exception of very few holy persons such as Luther or Calvin, no one really knew for sure if she were saved or not. And he claimed that this was a common view among Calvinists by his own day. For the vast majority of souls, therefore, to err in good faith was quite possible. Further, God obliged us to follow our conscience, even if it was an error. And I'm going to read this wonderful quote from uh, the Commentaire Philosophique. Um, as you'll be able to tell, I love Bale. Um, it is not necessary for me to remind my reader that I do not exclude grace from that act by which we adhere to revealed truths. Would that it were always grace that makes us feel, sentir, feel that such and such a reading of scripture is true, and grace which modifies us in such a manner that precisely that reading that is true appears true to us. But I do say that the grace which produces this sentiment does not, for all that, give us knowledge of any proof that is certain and free of objections. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I only add that since faith gives us no marks of orthodoxy except an interior sentiment and conviction of conscience, a mark that can be found among the most heretical of men, it follows that the final analysis of our belief is that we sense that and that it seems to us that it is true. <clears throat> so in an earlier publication, Bale had already addressed the common objection, which goes back to Augustine at least, that, quote, the author of all things gives the right of entry into one's heart and into one's soul only to the truth, unquote. Not so, said, said Bale. <clears throat> On faith, uh, Bale warned that the history of Christianity since the Reformation did not offer much support for this view. Quoting Bale, to put it simply, there is a truth that presents itself in the image of a lie, either to the Catholics or to the Reformed, and an error that presents itself in the image of the truth to one or the other. Without raising doubts about the unity of truth, Bale raised the question whether anyone could be sure she had grasped it. Um, so we have Bale talking about uh, the possibility of conscience to err in good faith, using the concept of an inner persuasion. We have Bloch, we have Tomasius, all talking about inner and outer. And I think that, the, you know, there's, this kind of talk has been around for centuries and centuries, but it has a new flavor to it. By inner, they mean something that involves persuasion. Uh, <clears throat> Tomasius talks about fundamental uh, uh, truths that one already knows. <clears throat> um, and what's different, I, th I think, about Bale is a daring, ironic tone. He, these remarks he makes about grace, I think, are one of the reasons he offended so many pious theologians. So I think a change in emotional norms was urged by all three thinkers as well. Locke condemned overheated zeal, that's his term, and insisted it must be replaced by, quote, the softness and civility of good usage. Um, Bale agreed that many people formulate doctrines, quote, out of personal resentments, family passions, jealousy, vanity, but thoughts about religious matters should be expressed, quote, gently and charitably, unquote. We have uh, <clears throat> Tomasius as well, inveighing against theologians who claimed they could purify their minds of the effects of Adam's fall sufficiently to serve as spokespersons of divine law. 
and he was apparently had some relationship with the pietist movement, which downplayed doctrinal differences in favor of uh, affection, Christian love. Trends favoring, the, okay, trends favoring this movement towards a secular outlook, well, there's too many to, to mention. Uh, they would include uh, mechanist metaphysics associated with uh, uh, um, <clears throat> natural philosophy, the disturbing outcome of the Thirty Years' War, the intense philological research, especially on the text of scripture that was going on in the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> all these trends contributed to a growing conviction that the individual is alone with her own thoughts and passions. And of course, such isolation was more disturbing in the case of passions, for, for obviously. Why? Because thoughts could at least in principle be articulated, examined and revised. Sentiments and passions were much less easily expressed or controlled. And since the Reformation, the connections between faith and what we would call emotions had been strengthened. <clears throat> And here, I'm happy to rely on Lyndall Roper's new biography of Luther, who saw uh, his belief in the promises of the scripture that if you believe, you will be saved. Um, I argue that for him, this kind of belief was emotional in character, and it saved him from the, uh, from the uh, despair of his inability to obey the commandments of the scripture. Well, you we could go on with many other examples from the Reformation of this sense of a, a very intense emotional kind of belief that brought a kind of certainty and a kind of safety from, uh, from despair with it, and which by mid-17th century was losing some of it, a great deal of its credibility. <clears throat> For example, just one example which I like, uh, Jesuit confessors in Ven Vienna, Munich, Madrid, Paris consistently urged rulers to support a Catholic reconquest of Northern Europe during the early phases of the Thirty Years' War. But by the mid-1630s, opinion within even the Jesuit order began to shift. In 1639, the Congregation of the Jesuit Province of Upper Germany approved a text that suggested, quote, it seems that it does not please God that the Catholic religion be propagated in Germany by force of arms, so that another method of resisting heresy must be taken up. The Jesuits ought to focus their efforts on countering the flood of new Protestant books, they suggested. And the author of this uh, proposal was later sent to Rome to help in the election in 1646 of a new general for the order, Vincenzo Carafa, who demanded a thorough disengagement of Jesuits from temporal affairs. <clears throat> now, of course, the willingness to tolerate religious differences had been much in evidence from the beginning of the Reformation, but uh, I, th I think I see signs that by the mid-17th, this willingness was getting the upper hand. Um, just one example. Uh, Hubert Bost, uh, Pierre Bale's biographer, notes that by 1697, when the first edition of the famous Dictionnaire Historique et Critique came out, theories of toleration, which had been condemned as recently as 1691 at the Synod of Amsterdam, had become, quote, accepted among all Huguenot refugees and scandalized few, if any. Of course, we know that John Locke returned to England in 1688 as a, a kind of informal intellectual spokesperson for the uh, ascendant Whig party. <clears throat> this period also saw a significant decline in witchcraft trials, which I won't say anything about. This is many people here know more than me. Uh, I think I remember Isabel Hull arguing that there was a gradual relaxation of sexual discipline across Central Europe in the late 17th. Claude Perrault's Stories of Mother Goose came out in 1697. And interestingly, he dished up fantasies and fairy tales of the unlearned as if they were curious and entertaining 
rather than dangerous threats to religious orthodoxy. So there are many remarkable clues to a deeper change in attitudes, and I would include among these clues the new prominence of literary salons, the rise of the novel, spreading interest in theater. These are all activities that women were deeply involved in. The spread of the coffee house and coffee house conversation, a new brand of chatty periodicals such as the Tatler or the Spectator or the Mercure Gallant, um, <clears throat> pietism, uh, and I would include the early phases of development of Freemasonry, uh, <clears throat> all forms of sociability that reached across confessional lines and involved a kind of uh, gentleness and charity, good usage, affection. <clears throat> Politeness, as it came to be called in England. Um, I would link all these things back to the spreading idea that our insides are sealed off from spiritual influences. We no longer have to worry if someone sitting next to us is an agent of the devil. Um, <clears throat> because even if they were, they wouldn't even know it. Um, okay, besides a more cosmopolitan, mutual respect and even affection, besides a new emphasis on the softness and civility of good usage in discussions of philosophy, religion, and law, there was also a quite noticeable growth in taste for irony. Bale's an early representative of this kind of irony, an irony that is supposed to be revealing of an important truth. It's not just carnivalesque mockery, it's irony in the service of some kind of philosophical insight, <clears throat> which we see very widely uh, employed in works such as Lettre Paysan, or I would put on the list uh, probably uh, <clears throat> Mandeville's The Fable of the Bees, many of Voltaire's works, and so on. <clears throat> um, now, one more thing I just want to mention before coming to a close, and this is the interesting fact about the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, which is often cited as a great uh, kind of throwback event when Louis XIV decided to get rid of all the Protestants in the country, <clears throat> outlawed the Huguenot Church, and forced all the ministers either to go underground or to flee the country. Um, what's interesting is that a good number of pastors, we don't know how many, uh, we just have people condemning this fact, a good number of pastors told their flocks that to go ahead and convert. If you convert, you, if you converted, you would save your offices, you would conserve preserve, protect your properties, you would get, you would get the uh, uh, billeted troops who were destroying your house out of the house, threatening your daughters and so on, out of the house. Um, and, you know, it's a response to coercion that gives you peace and safety. Um, God isn't going to hold that against you. Uh, one uh, one uh, critic of this idea called the pastors who promoted it said they were, quote, perverted by philosophy, and, quote, did not fear to twist scripture so that it agreed with their theories, unquote. Um, and there are many, many cases, I don't know how many, uh, but I have found a few in the archives anyway, of families who had the male head of the family convert, and perhaps his heir, but certainly we have this cases where Protestant families have a male head generation after generation who is baptized into the Catholic Church at birth, and the rest of the family is obviously Protestant in practice and outlook, and probably that, that baptized male uh, <coughs> uh, head of family is also Protestant uh, in private. Um, and this suggests, again, a willingness on the part of a large number of people to divide the inner from the outer, to accept coercion. They're doing what Tomasi is said to do, obey the authorities with your outward practice, but recognize that your understanding 
is above the law. It cannot be touched by the law. So um, <clears throat> there's lots of evidence like this that I'm trying to pull together. And what I'm interested in is why this split worked and how it worked for people and how many people it worked for. Obviously worked well for a lot of people, but it must have been quite a different way of experiencing your emotions from the way that Luther or Calvin experienced them, which is that at any moment your emotions might be bringing messages to you from either divine or, or uh, uh, demonic uh, sources. <clears throat> and uh, this is my little effort to, to use the notion of emotives to mainstream the history of emotions, to integrate our understanding of emotions into our understandings of the big transitions of European history, such as the Thirty Years' War, or the uh, Glorious Revolution, or the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and so on. <clears throat> Thank you.